Sayaka, I, I, I thought that it might be useful. Uh, one, one case I was thinking of that might be somewhat different from the example that you chose in Japanese uh, is uh, what happens with certain logical operators. So the kind of case I'm thinking of is the conditional, where the, the normal conditional uh, is uh, a sufficient condition for the truth. The antecedent presents a sufficient condition for the truth of the consequent. So if it's raining, you will get wet. Uh, and then you have the subjective and the intersubjective variance. And the two that I was thinking, was thinking of uh, were First, the, the classic so-called speech act or Austin or biscuit conditional. Uh, if you're thirsty, there's some beer in the fridge, where right. it's a sufficient condition for the relevance of the, uh, of the antecedent. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not sufficient condition for the truth, but for the relevance. And then there are cases like, if you don't mind my saying so, blah, 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 or if this isn't too personal, then blah, 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 where it has nothing to do with truth or relevance, but a kind of politeness thing, which some of your examples reminded me of. So that was that was just a, an observation. And for, for Paula, I, I guess one of the, the questions that I had was um, the, the finding that for adult speakers of English and other Germanic languages, um, more than half of definites uh, are new information definites. Um, but the kinds of data that we're dealing with there, as opposed to the controlled experiments with the, with the bunnies, uh, allows for what uh, Ellen Prince called hearer-old as opposed to discourse-old information. So the classic case is the sun. You know, where I think fairly early on children, uh, it, you know, understand that they can talk about the sun without the discourse having brought up the sun and making it a familiar reference. Uh, the uniqueness and, you know, the, the knowledge that we share this common ground in which there is one uniquely identifiable sun or the moon or the, the dog, you know, is another example, that kind of thing. So, so it's, um, you know, some of those you could say are familiar in the discourse, but a lot of them are not. And I, I don't know whether that's something that would change, you know, from one language to another. I think it, the, the data that I've seen are, are Germanic languages like English and Swedish. Maybe Romance languages would be different in that respect. I think that in, in our case, the fact that there were children looking like children's stories. Right. It made the owls tell it as if these were established characters. Like if, like if you say Mickey Mouse. So I have people saying La Señora Coneja, Miss Miss Rabbit, or La Coneja, the rabbit, as a, what's this, a name? Right. It's like a character, established character. So many people adopted that strategy from beginning to end. Yeah. I wonder if they were teachers. Right? They, I doubt very much that you would have called, imagine a bunny, you know, coming out of a cage and doing something in a folklore. I doubt that they would have used the same. So a, a yeah. way to look for that would be to use pictures to elicit pictures that was clear is the same animal, only that you don't turn it into a character and call it like an animal. But, but yes, those were there clearly. Thank you. Yes, so my original motivation for um, doing this semantic judgment is I wanted to see something that doesn't show as a symptom, symptom or a discussion. So I was looking at it on the, um, the mind of informants here based. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I did think about that logical period, like if um, mm -hmm. you're hungry, there's a community or type. I, I think um, I think I do need to come, you know, um, incorporate that, uh, especially if I'm working on a discourse like excerpts with a, um, like a large chunk of um, each instance can be a large piece of discourse. So I think uh, uh, if conditional will be possible. Yeah. I was looking at originally looking at adverb collocations. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Um, my point is relevant, um, and that is that 
the third demonstrative is near the speaker, near the address. Yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking what possibility it would be to collect eye tracking data with uh, eye tracking glasses and to see how these kids track attentional state and distance and, and that type of extra information on top of the users. So to see what are they monitoring. But uh, I guess they say need interactive back to the see do I need interactive data for sure. Definitely. I also wonder if uh, I don't know, is it okay for me to uh, no, 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 this time? <laughs> I was wondering if, uh, if you had two characters that were equally, you know, salient, A could take away the pronoun issue because they'd have to use the dog versus the bunny. Mm -hmm. And the second is probably the Dexus piece might be do you think it would be reduced at least in the kind of test that Paula had? You know, so since they're both equally. It, it still is. If you have a cartoon, you've got two characters. And you're, still um, you're, the, you're, you're not in the situation. I mean, you are, you, even if you can't even imagine yourself, you don't know where you would imagine yourself being in that situation that's depicted. So, it's worthwhile trying to figure out a way to do this in fact with this on. Yes, it's not true, but, but, but I think that would be, that would be, yeah. we were just interested in just the first pass to see, you know, how hard it is to acquire these systems depending on how complex the system is. It's very, very obvious, but they are, they are. You interact with your mother. Yes. Or father. Yeah. Or grandparents. Okay. <laughs> um, those of us who are grandparents really, uh, you know, our, our grandchildren are really learning something by interacting. Yeah. And that's the way they learn all of their language. One thing I noticed with two characters in the cartoon is that even if the child, this didn't happen with us, only with the kids, even if the child had already switched to the deafness, so imagine uh, there's a bunny leaving the house and she's in the rain, or the bunny now is under, is out getting wet. And then there's a bunny, the same bunny, with another character. And they switch to a bunny by, you know, they introduce, now there's a pig and a bunny, and, you know, I, I don't know if it would be, maybe, maybe it's just, you know, taxi, know taxi how to you be know using they, both. They, how, do, how do you know they know it's the same bunny? Oh, well, we're saying, you know, they, 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 everything is yeah, no, that's not constant. Because they're toy, they're dolls, dolls. You can they, they look alike. Yeah, they have different colors different individuals. So. And in fact, what they're telling you is that they have just assumed that these aren't the same character. Okay. That's and the other to let to yeah. The person at the back Hi. who's been waiting for you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm not um, visiting until tomorrow, but I really enjoyed um, listening to this particular set of thoughts. And I was thinking about yes, the issue of, uh, of using this sort of storyboard past the very part that I'm trying to figure out in the Creole language that I'm working on what is happening with variability and variance, what is happening where it seems like the definite demonstrative structures are used almost interchangeably in certain contexts. And I'm trying to have adults use a wordless, uh, a wordless children's storybook to do it. But then I run into the same issue where you mentioned, you know, there, there, there are frogs in the book, and suddenly I get a Mr. Frog. What do I do with that? Or every single, or every couple of pages when they perceive that there's a new scene, suddenly me in my position using Prince's framework of trying to do newness and oldness, you know, to discourse here, well, you know, are we talking about within the whole task? Are we talking about within the scene? Because it seems like some of my speakers are organized in the narrative a little bit differently, like it's complicated. Um, and I'm trying to bring in more participants and, and finding ways of doing this work, I've been thinking about trying to do something um, puppet related, and which, which would be kind of, I, I, I thought even the things I was doing would be too, you know, chipping out for my adults, but they were having fun, so I was trying to think of ways where like, you don't shift between pages, right? So there's no possibility of you thinking, oh, this is a completely new picture. If you see the same puppet kind of, you know, maybe if I'm like silently acting out a story and you're narrating for me, maybe I won't run into these conflicts. I'm not sure. It's something I'm just 
cut their permanence. Because that is still something yeah. kids do have to acquire. Yeah. Um, and so depending on, I don't know at what age that happens, but depending on the age of your participants, that may still you know, we tell a, a children's book story, we say the prince turned into a frog. And for, for kids, it's like, you know, having those be the same character is very, very difficult. So I wonder about the age of development for them, if they have that permanence yet, and maybe having like a, a physical age would give you that, that day situation, but also the permanence. Does anyone have a question for Martin? <laughs> 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 Yes, and in the I was case just wondering of what kind of context they were and also how you manipulate it without making it circular. Without making it circular? Yeah. So these are the types of context that would affect the judgment in these cases, right? Like you want to somehow define the source score. Okay. I was just wondering how you. So, so uh, yes, I, uh, I didn't have time to show the examples. <laughs> that was cut out in the end. But uh, in the cases where we were analyzing the event in progress reading, and I call them rich and poor, rich contexts were contexts that established that both the speaker and adversary in the vignette that was being presented share perceptual access to the event that the sentence described later on. So if the speaker were to say, I'm watching TV, the, all the context presented that speaker and other C were like, but the other C had perceptual access to the speaker watching TV. And in the poor context, it would be in different rooms, let's say. So that was what the context would present. Like, I'm here, like, you know, John got, John gets home, and here's, I mean, he's watching TV, or like, this doesn't say he's watching TV, but like, and here's something in the other room, and then Anna tells her, I'm watching TV. So somehow like access to the information, whether both of them have the same loan of information about yeah. the design. Yes, if they share, yeah, I mean, all the conditions, the condition was whether they were either in the same place, if they were co-present, or if they have perceptual access in, with respect to a third person, for instance, like they were both watching outside and someone was doing something. And in the case of the, of the habitual reading, where it, was, where it was about whether there were salient alternatives in this course, where the proposition did not hold or not, that was what we call supporting and useful. So an example was, um, I don't know, John and Mary go to college together and they're both always late and all of a sudden one gets there on time or something like that, so something where you kind of have access to a point where they were both always, or, or John was always late, and one day he's there on time, so Mary asks him, like, how did he get there? And he can say something like, oh, I'm riding my bike this place. Like, you can say that in Spanish. Whereas, if she doesn't have access to that previous time where the proposition of riding the bike didn't hold, he would need to say, I ride my bike. Uh, I see, okay, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have something that I hope might tie them together and you may disagree and tell me if I'm wrong. It's after all three blocks in a row, so <laughs> uh, but, uh, it seems like all of these studies are uh, studying trends that point in very similar directions, although the terminology is not always the same. So, for example, theory of mind versus common ground versus intersubjectivity. I think these are all trends that are oriented in the same way. And you've seen a nice combination of both the ontogenetic and diachronic perspectives on this of the time depths. Uh, but we've only seen one study that has looked at it both in, from a broader perspective, and that was uh, Paula, I believe, yes, uh, where you actually make a predictive framework for all of these things simultaneously by linking this notion of the expansion of, of uh, different, uh, let's say, grades of theory of mind into the ground, which I think is beautiful, though it works out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not very nice. But uh, what was really great right here is that you have the kids there uh, doing the child study. So I wonder, can you do the same, or would you make uh, similar predictions 
uh, on the ontogenetic scale for uh, your the other two projects. Uh, so do you see different, would you expect, for example, the differential rates of emergence of the uses that are dispreferred in your special case? or in the case of um, mm -hmm. the use of this specialized form that carries more of this intersubjective meaning do you see these emerging later in childhood and can you correlate those maybe to the same emergence of uh, more general cognitive behaviors in the interaction so it's theory of mind or whatever else. Um, okay. So I don't have developmental data or Data yet, but, but you um, agree with the with the, the premise. premise. Well, yeah, is is I, I see it for those two. I don't see it so clearly for his that you're the that there's a, a theory of mind component to the to the uh, with a greater complexity the theory of mind mm -hmm. relies on the more grammaticized and I don't see. It, whether it's that it needs, whereas the use of the progressive needs a more. I don't know. I, 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 oh. it, 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 uh, it's just, what did you see the theory of mind in this uh, case? Oh, okay. well, it doesn't necessarily have to be theory of mind with this notion of uh, wasn't yeah. there a component just of this general. common ground uh, to the different uses? I, I don't know. I, I've made yeah, some notes that I'm trying to. The perceptual yeah. alignment. Uh, yeah. alignment, yes, which you, 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 you sort of stick in the place of what I guess other people call audience design uh, yes. or these other types of things. Um, so, so you're supplanting it, but it ultimately, if it explains the same phenomenon, it might tie into say, uh, these uh, cognitive development uh, trajectories. No, I think it's a very interesting point that you're bringing, but I. I'm not sure. I mean, I have to. I I, I need to think about it. I know. Um, I think. I'm, I'm thinking about of a question that Jacob asked me in the last meeting. Is and that is, I, I can you think about this as well, looking at the Hindi data. So assuming, for the sake of the argument, that, that numeral one is an indefinite in the making, assuming it, what type of data do Hindi-speaking children hear? What are they learning from? Because yeah. the question for Martin. Since this is really a meaning in flux, I don't know, you know, I'm looking at the definite article in Spanish and English, which is well established. The kid, you know, there's a regularity in the input they take, they get. Whereas if these uses are fluctuate, fluctuating, like what, yeah, what, what that means for acquisition, is there, you Sorry, know, yeah, it, 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 it adds a level of complexity that is huge, right? No, yeah, I'm scared, we I'm do, scared no, we do have data own. from, 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 Kids only for the start, so not on the, on the progressive uses, but you have double predicates. Mm -hmm. And since we observe an extension in the adult, what you get from the kids is an extension too. So it only contributes to the diachronic process. So it's harder to establish there where, like, how are these cognitive forces coming into play, or if it's just a reproduction of what they're getting, like a, a further on, like a further generalization or simplification of the system, or whatever you want to call it. Great way to study that, look at the corpus data, uh, naturalistic corpus data, and then look at this uh, dialectal difference and see how the Mexican Spanish speaking kids differ from the ones that show uh, this, this more complex uh, uh, referential system. So, where it's been neutralized, you would expect different acquisitional profiles than in the Mexican. Um, so about the acquisition thing, I mean, the closest I thought about um, what you were referring to is um, the fact that so one of the three functions, three types of functions, the, the subjectivity, subjective regret meaning is uh, there is a um, L1 study on Shimon, and subjective meaning is the first, I mean, most common. I mean, the kids pretty much exposed to that. Oh, the toy will be broken, or you know. So subjective meaning is prominent, and I think that uh, the, the frequency, the overwhelming frequency that I found for uh, regret meaning, and might be have something to do with this mother's 
input. And as, as far as interest, well, intersubjective is a little bit tricky because this is something you learn later in your life, like being tactful and uh, using the marker of regret to indicate modesty and so on. Uh, I haven't really thought about it. I mean, maybe this is just my assumption, but maybe kids do employ that strategy. But then, when you look at the diatonic context, I mean, intersubjectification, I mean, intersubjective uses increase over time also. So I am just, uh, yeah, I haven't really um, come up with a good systematic analysis that tapping you know, both dimensions, like one, you know, the span of a single person's life, and as opposed to, you know, that chronic context of a society, speech community. So, yeah, that gave me a really good perspective. <laughs> Thank you. Did you have a question? I've got a good question for um, So, you're talking about the, um, the presence or absence of a supportive context being predictive of the use of um, the progressive of the, of the present progressive or the simple present. No, and yes, and not enough predict. Well, yes, not predictive, but associated. Yes. And, and so, I, but I was looking at this question. Uh, so the on the one hand, we have a, a discrete difference, uh, discrete and discrete difference. Right? The system parents will choose one of those tenses. The other, there's there's no in between. And yet, in terms of the context, um, although you operationalize that as a dichotomy of presence or absence. Clearly, in the real world, there would be a continuum of um, richness of context and a continuum of the accessibility of that context for the FSC. Uh, so, I just wondered, what do you think is, is going on there? Is there is there a gradient in terms of the likelihood of use of a particular form in relation to the um, richness or accessibility of the context? Uh, or are there some threshold conditions such that you think that there's like a, a non-linearity you, you have maybe a greater chance of using that form as the conditions increase, but at some point it chops off and then I, I mean, it's purely <laughs> uh, hypothetical, but it's, I do feel that there's a gradient and that you would get uh, more variation in context where it's difficult to say where one form would be more appropriate than the other given the contextual information that you have at hand. But but that there is a threshold and like that's what we found in, in our studies of like when the speaker and the other team don't share perceptual access, you're not allowed to use the simple present anymore. Spanish becomes like English. You can't use it to to express an event in progress reading. As, you, you, like in English, you can. You, I mean, unless some particular examples, right? Like here comes the train and stuff like that. But to express a progressive, you need to use the present progressive. And the difference in English seems to be more categorical than it is in Spanish, where you get this variability, where there's a lot of contexts that people have called free variation contexts. But you know, the, the point here, I think, is determining what, what are the conditions in those free variation contexts. That when a speaker comes to a situation, my take at least is that there's something that makes the speaker decide whether to use one form or the other. It's not just using a point. So the factor that we think we're being able to identify is whether they share perceptual access to the situation or not. For the for the case of the event to further And you think that's very Um well, no, 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 because of the accessibility judgment results. Because it's not that we're getting ones when they don't share and fives when they share. We're getting threes and twos and four and fives. So there is variability there. It is pretty consistent. So if you look across items and across speakers, you don't get that much of a. I mean, you, you sort of get the same pattern. Some speakers are rating, you get the typical thing that some speakers are rates twos and fours and some threes and fives, but the magnitude effect is sort of similar across items and across speakers. So, so
So that extra bump of like getting average context, they do get it. And they are able to use that marker. So, so how about the facts with the disappointing results. Um, so I was wondering, I think one of the things obviously with kind of, kind of hard to make sure that the participants who really buy really get that the person who's showing them this thing doesn't know what they actually can't see. And I wonder if you look at the film screen, but you might even see this as well. You have one page, so it's a paper, paper they are another one just kind of highlighted by being in a special box. And this person here who sort of probably knows about these things is saying they were the paper. So I don't know, what can you do to kind of avoid that problem? Do you think that might be hard to form what you think that it, I mean, it also is hard to ask? So there's a cover story that we have tried many versions, by the way. One with three year olds, I was puppeteering everyone, Cookie Monster, and each had a box, and I don't remember exactly the story, but we've tried with, you know, light puppets, total paper. They were going by size. So the object was closer. He said the big one, which says the closer to so this one, there was a cover story. It was one character, Tom, in warm-up trials, uh, who didn't know what was in the box, just to, so that they, to see if the kids understood. And he was offering the child who play with the rooster. So which of the two roosters, there was identical this time, uh, was Tom like, to play with, how do you know? And you know, we get answers like he, he cannot see in the box, or he didn't know, so the, the basics were in place. And then we added, him, the girl you saw, and it turned into a detective story because Kim sometimes turned the box around and our task was to guess from what Kim was telling us whether she had looked inside the box before she invited us to play or not. So that was the cover story. And so the other side is hard. I mean, we really, really thought it was pretty obvious. I mean, the, the one with the adjectives, this, there was a beautiful, beautiful Results because I'm a data junkie. I had to run a second uh, condition where instead of using size, which is a relative type of adjective, right? So big, big horse or small pig is it's in relation to the other guy. What happens when you use color, which is used descriptively much more often? It comes. They get it much less. You know, the red shoes. There are so many reasons why you could be referring to the shoes as red. Not only because there are green shoes in the box, but you know, because very often to shoes by color, so the, they went to you know, below channels. So there are some you know, nuances there, but I think it's a hard task. So Maria is saying that they should stop. <laughs>